All right, here we go, everybody. Welcome back to Bird Talk, episode five. Today's show, we're going to get into talking about filming our upland hunting adventures. And I've been filming my upland hunts for the last two going on three years now uh, with your GoPro action style cameras. And I just want to give a little bit of insight on the cameras that I use, uh, some of the pros and cons to them. I have two different cameras that I use some of tips that I've learned along the ways, uh, how I mount the cameras, basically my whole routine and everything that goes into filming your hunts, all the way down to how I, the settings that I use on the camera, the frame rate that I shoot in, the size resolution that I shoot in on the cameras, and then even down to storing the footage once you record it and you're ready to save it and put it away for a later date. And just to give you guys a background on my my personal background and kind of what my career has been and how I've evolved into this a little bit is I used to professionally film hunts for outdoor television for I had a good probably a four year run at it uh, where I was just out of uh, college and I was getting into filming hunts and that was what I was super passionate about and that's actually kind of how my whole career that I've had evolved was from me when I graduated high school, I picked up a small little camcorder and took it out to the deer blind with me and started recording my hunts. And I I really enjoyed the aspect of it, of trying to tell the story, exactly how everything goes down and what you're up to and just creating a nice story for the audience to, to be watching. And not just going out and killing film or filming kill shots or that part of it, just setting up the whole story, the picture of what was going on. And really that just evolved into what my career became. Uh, I used to, like I said, I, I filmed my my deer hunts when I was younger and that transcribed into filming more of my hunts, uh, getting more equipment, more cameras, Uh, going deeper into it, and I really developed a love for filming, photography, and yeah, it just kind of evolved into what I wanted to do for my career. So I went to school for digital media production, which was working cameras, editing film, uh, Photoshop, graphic design, all those things, uh, a little bit of the marketing side, and yeah, just things kept evolving, and before you know it, I was filming my own hunts, then I was offering to film other people's hunts, and before I knew it, I was traveling across the country filming hunts for outdoor television TV, uh, shows that airs on the Sportsman Channel, the Outdoor Channel. I filmed a lot of bear hunts everywhere from New Jersey uh, all the way out to Alaska, Manitoba, Alberta, here in Michigan in the UP, filmed some whitetail hunts here in Michigan, down in Illinois, uh, filmed a couple of mule deer hunts out west in Colorado, Wyoming, filmed a couple of uh, elk hunts as well out west in Wyoming, New Mexico, Yeah, so I've got a pretty good kind of database knowledge of from, you know, how I handled things in those years that kind of also relates to how I'm still doing my routine these days and filming my upland hunts. Even though the cameras are a little bit different, I'm not using, you know, the bigger style cameras, handheld style camera recorders that you would carry around in the field filming, you know, your subject or whoever your hunter was that you were following into the woods that day. I'm uh, using much smaller action style Go, GoPro style cameras and it's a little bit of, you know, different side but you know still some of the same fundamentals apply to it. So, yeah, we're going to get into that on today's episode and just give an inside look of how I film my hunts, uh some of the things I've learned that hopefully can help you if you want to get into filming your hunts just to be able to relive some stuff or, you know, put your hunts out there, what you're doing, and yeah, hopefully you can learn a few things from this. So before we get into that, just want to give an update on some of the stuff going on here. Uh, As mentioned in a previous episode, we were looking at having a litter of puppies, and they did arrive. So first of all, I I do want to apologize if you hear a puppy or a dog or two piping pipe up in the background. We do have a litter of six Britneys, healthy little chunky pups now. They were born a week ago. 
they're active, they're starting to move around a little bit more every day. Uh, they, we ended up with four females and two males and one liver of each sex. So we had a liver male and a liver female. So it's been a fun process. It's been fun seeing the pups grow over the last week here. Our first pup arrived on the 29th of June at 1.15 in the morning and the last one arrived at 6.43 in the morning. So it was, a, it was a long night for us, but our female Ember, she did a great job with it. The first one came out and then we had a little bit of a time period before the second one came out, but once that second pup came out, they all, start, they all followed pretty quick and she picked up on it really fast of what she was supposed to be doing with the pups. So she's done a great job at caring for them, cleaning for them. And yeah, we haven't had to do much except we did the tails and dew claws and have just been weighing them daily and checking in on them, making sure everybody's healthy. And yeah, they all look really good right now. Uh, they all have homes they're going to. They're all going to be grouse dogs here in Michigan, and we are we are going to keep one. There's a little white female, pink collar. We call her Pinky right now, and we do have plans of keeping her. So we have a new addition coming to our pack of dogs this fall. So super excited about that. And yeah, this just been a it's been a fun process overall. And so outside of the pups, if you're watching this on YouTube, I am wearing a new hat today. The hat is not available, but it's a hat we've been sampling. Uh, we've been getting a lot of requests over the last year for a full canvas hat and not just a canvas in the front panels and then mesh in the back, but a full canvas hat. And this one is all blaze, has kind of your classic traditional look of your brown bill on the front. And yeah, it's just a nice looking, comfortable hat. And we just put our Uplander logo on the bottom left panel and just kind of kept it clean, easy to look at, not a whole lot going on. Yeah, it's a nice looking hat, super comfortable. So be looking for those to be available towards the end of this month in July. And also what's going to be available is our performance line that we're coming out with. So we're going to have short and long sleeves, 100% polyester material. They're super comfortable, super breathable, lightweight, moisture wicking, odor resistant, and they're going to make absolutely badass shirts for wearing in the early season or if you're out training dogs towards the end of this summer. And yeah, going on a hunting trip, you're going to be able to wear these shirts for multiple days in a row and just super excited to be bringing those out and to be wearing a few of them this fall. So going into the end of this month, be on the lookout for that. Appreciate all the support, guys. Just want to say that as well. And the more support that we get from you guys with Uplander, the more we can keep doing here on Bird Talk, our social media content our content and videos that we're producing on YouTube. If you haven't seen our YouTube videos, go ahead, go over and check out our YouTube account. It's just called Uplander. We've got, I think, 13 different hunting videos from the last year on there, videos from Montana, here in Michigan, Arizona in January. And I'll hint at some of those videos today with today's uh, episode to try and give everybody a look at what camera I was using on those videos and how that camera looks in comparison to a couple of the other cameras that I use as well. So again, just want to say thanks for all the support guys. It really helps us be able to continue to produce content here. Uh, we're trying to keep this show unsponsored, not bog it down with ads. And one way we can do that is just through your guys' continued support with Uplander. So just want to say thanks for that. So with all that going, let's go ahead and get into today's episode. Like I said, I do apologize if you hear you know, a little puppy pipe up now and then in the background. If they start getting a little too vocal, I'll shut the recording off, let them die down a little bit, and then... Uh, yeah, get back into the episode at that point. So let's go ahead, get into it, and we're going to dive right into the couple of cameras that I use. So I have two cameras that I use. They are action style cameras to record my upland hunts. I have a DJI Osmo Action Cam and a GoPro Hero 10. They are both 
pretty comparable. There's not a whole lot of difference between the two cameras. They perform. I, I, I'm happy with the performance of both. They both work great for upland hunters and what I'm trying to do specifically with the action style GoPro camera mounted on my head and capturing footage that way. They both uh, settings are very similar on the two. There's just a couple small pros and cons difference between the two. So specifically looking at the DJI Osmo action cam, I call that camera my workhorse. I've never had an issue with it. It records every single time flawlessly. It works well. It's easy to use, simple to use, produces great footage. It's capable of shooting up to 4K it shoots slow motion, it's waterproof, and the thing that I like most about this is I can use a wide range of micro SD cards in it without having an issue. And that's one of the issues that I, fat, that I battle with the GoPro, is if you are not using the highest class card, the fastest card out there, as far as data transfers, for a micro SD card, you do have problems with the GoPro, where it freezes up, and it will actually lose the current file that it's recording and I've had it also bug out and corrupt other files as well. And like I said, it, it freezes up from time to time if you're not using the correct file or the correct SD card in the GoPro 10. But as far as the DJI Osmo action cam, I've never had an issue with that and that camera. And that is one big advantage that I find to that camera is I've never had an issue with it. So the DJI and the GoPro 10, they both offer video stabilization, which what that does is if you take the camera and you rock it side to side, or if you're moving around a little bit, it stabilizes the video. And that is probably the most key feature in recording upland hunts is using a camera that has video stabilization. Because if you're using a camera that doesn't have video stabilization or you're using your camera without that mode turned on, then your footage is going to look really jumpy. It's going to be blurry. It's going to look like you're bouncing all over the place and like you're trying to film the Blair Witch Project. So video stabilization is absolutely key when it comes to filming your upland hunts. And the one thing that I don't like about the DJI Osmo action cam is that if you try and shoot in a frame rate over 60 feet per second, then your video stabilization goes away. You can't use it if you want to shoot like, let's say 120 frames per second. And just to, just to back up here a little bit more on frame rates. So to get slow motion, you have to be shooting in at least 60 frames per second. And if you want really super slow motion, you're looking at using 120 frames per second. So if you're thinking about if you've seen some of our hunts in the past before, and I have some slow motion of birds getting up and really nice on the rise, super slow motion, I was shooting in 120 frames per second on those shots and they came from the GoPro 10. Now you can get some good, decent slow motion with 60 frames per second, but you can't slow it down as much and get the ultra super smooth slow motion as you can with 120 frames per second. And just to kind of geek out on what frames per second and all that is real quick, um, it's how many frames that the camera is taking per second. Video isn't just one, smooth, constant frame. A video is put together by a camera taking a lot of frames or basically snapping a picture really fast within a one second interval. And the more frames that the camera is able to snap within a one second interval, the easier it is to slow the footage down and make it look super, super smooth, slow motion. So if you record in 60 frames per second, that means that that camera just in a one second interval took 60 frames. It took, a, it took 60 pictures of whatever happened in that one second interval. If you're on 120 frames per second, that camera just took 120 pictures. So double the pictures of 60 frames per second. So think of now you spread out all of those 60 pictures 
for that one second interval and then let's say right below that you spread out the 120 pictures and now you want to slow down the footage well the jumpiness has been extremely decreased going from the 60 to the 120 because let's just look at my arm moving here how much i can move my arm in one second the we're going to capture a lot more frames of my arm moving in 120 frames per second than we would in 60 frames per second so that means we can slow it down and make it look a lot smoother in 120 frames per second than it would in 60 frames per second so to get ultra slow smooth slow motion you're looking at 120 feet per second at least and 60 feet per second at the minimum that gets you a little bit of slow motion but it doesn't get you like the extreme super slow motion so anyways getting back on off that tangent and on to what we were talking about with the cameras is the dji if you shoot in anything higher than 60 frames per second you cannot shoot in video stabilization so basically you can record in higher frame rates but you won't have the video stabilization video stabilization and your video will look a lot rockier it won't be very smooth uh, but on the on the GoPro, I can shoot in a lot higher frame rates, even up to 240 frames per second if I wanted to, still have the video stabilization on it. So that's just one leg that the GoPro has up on the DJI. And I, I look at the, the GoPro as a little bit more of the Ferrari of the cameras. It's a lot more uh, high performance, but... If you have an issue with it, it can be a little bit more of a, a stickier issue and take a little bit more resolution to it than just your, your basic, regular, everyday car. You know, parts are not as easy to get as in comparison with the DJI. Anything that I've ever had issues with, I'm able to take care of it really fast. The GoPro, I got kind of got to mess with it a little bit to get it back on track. But one of the couple of things that I like about the GoPro in comparison to the DJI is I think it produces a little bit better of a quality image. You get super slow motion with video stabilization. It has more options and features. I'm not going to dive into all the options and features if there's plenty of research out there of and videos that dive into exactly all the features and what they are of each camera but you do get more um how do i say this more more frame looks with the with the gopro so if you want a super super wide fish angle looking lens there's a couple different settings for the gopro you can have a super wide looking one you can have a medium wide and then you can have your just your standard flat looking video as well with the dji it's either a fisheye look or just your regular flat look and i like the gopro because it just gives you a little bit more of an options when it comes to that to be able to pick exactly what you like the look of and how you want your footage to turn out it has a lot better sensor and low light so the the footage is a lot clearer in low light it's not as grainy on the gopro the dji gets a little bit more grainier look to it in low light and also the video stabilization is a lot better on the gopro 10 in low light than the dji the dji gets a little bit more of a jumpier look to it in low light where the gopro still runs super a super super smooth look and the raw footage on the gopro 10 is a little bit flatter which it's it kind of has more of a muted look to it if you were to compare the the video side by side so the colors aren't as bright aren't as vibrant um, maybe for somebody like that for me that matters a little bit more because when i put that footage into post-production and i go to color correct it or change the look of it slightly it gives me a lot more freedom to be able to work with that that flatter footage whereas if you bring in a more vibrant looking footage it kind of limits you and it makes it tougher to do color corrections and work with your exposure uh, your your vibrance levels and things like that in post-production just the the footage from clip to clip doesn't look as good as a camera that shoots a little bit more of a flatter muted look video to it 
Now you can change that on the GoPro. You can put your video settings to be either the flat look, a more vibrant look, if you want a little bit more color to it. So you do have that option on the GoPro to kind of change the look of the video based on what you like and what you see. So another, another cool feature about the GoPro. What I don't like about the GoPro is how it freezes up. And I've had it do this in a couple of occasions where one, it was directly related to the card that I was running into it. If you do not run one of the extremely high class cards that is recommended on the GoPro website, which they are a little bit more pricier than some of the other just standard cards, you do run into issues where the file will just randomly stop recording out of nowhere. You'll hit record and you could be walking for five minutes and then all of a sudden the camera will freeze up and it'll delete that file that it was recording and I've also had it corrupt other files as well uh, that it was unrelated to that were still on that SD card. And just overall I've had a couple instances where I've even been running the high class cards that you're it's recommended to run in them where the camera is still froze up on me and I've you know had files corrupt on it and lost files where is in comparison to the DJI I've never had that issue I've never lost a file I've never had a file become corrupt so as far as the track record when it comes to uh, losing files the GoPro I've lost some on the DJI Osmo action camera never had an issue with that I'll give you a perfect example here Last January, we were in Arizona. We were going out on our first hunt for Mern's quail in Arizona, and we started off. I hit record. I was wearing both cameras on me at the time. Sometimes I will wear the DJI on a chest cam just for kind of maybe a second look or a different angle that the camera on my head doesn't give. So anyways, GoPro on my head, DJI on my chest, turn both cameras on, we start our hunt, and about five minutes into the hunt, my dog goes on point, I shoot a Mern's quail, I'm all jacked up, I knew I had both cameras running, I was excited to have the footage, I was excited that I shot a bird and that everything came together, and later that day, I go back to review the footage on my GoPro, and the first 10 seconds plays nice and then the rest of the file is all jittery and the video is cutting in and out and what happened was the camera basically corrupted the file and I lost that whole entire clip. I never got my dog on point, never got the bird getting up. All I had was my chest camera and it just caught a snippet of the bird taking flight and that was all I got out of the situation. So kind of a bummer to lose out uh, the footage on that hunt from that run that I had on the GoPro. And I, can't, I figured out what the issue was is the night before I had dumped the footage from the card onto a hard drive. And one little th trick with the GoPros that you have to do when you dump footage off of the card that you were filming on and you decide to put the card back into it now as a clean new card again, you have to go in on the camera and format that card, which basically means the camera goes, deletes everything on the card again itself, and then rewrites the card as its own format in relationship to that camera. And if you don't do that every single time you clear a card, what can happen is exactly what I experienced, where it can bug out, and you can lose files and that's exactly what happened to me so on the DJI whenever I've cleared out the camera or I'm sorry cleared out the video files on an SD card and then put that card back into the camera to start using it again never had that issue but it's something you have to do on the GoPro is format the card once you put that card back into the camera new and clean again with the files erased to start recording you have to format the card so those are just a couple of things that I like about each camera. Overall, they're very comparable. They both work pretty, pretty much the same side by side. There's a few things that I like a little bit more about each camera. You know, like I said, the DJI is just my, my workhorse. It's, I've never had a failure, failure with it, never had an issue. It's always performed flawlessly. The GoPro, I think it produces maybe a little bit better of a picture, but I do have the occasional issue with it. 
And that's what I have my one knock against the GoPro for is just being able to, you know, sometimes I just have those small little issues. And if you're looking for video references of how each video looks in comparison from camera to camera, that you can go on our YouTube channel and if you want to see hunts that were done just with the GoPro, look up our Arizona videos. There's one, two, and three videos from Arizona, all shot on the GoPro 10, and then also a Michigan pheasant hunt from last December in 2021. Those videos were all shot on the GoPro. You can get an idea of how that video looks and then you can watch ones that were shot on the dji in comparison which would have been our videos from montana last september and then all of the rough grouse hunts from 2020-21 last year on the channel those were all done with the dji so you can kind of watch those videos and get a good idea of what the quality looks like from each camera to camera again they're very similar they're both hd they look both look great but I think the footage on the GoPro just looks a little bit softer and a little bit more clear than it does on the DJI. Maybe the DJI looks a little bit more like a cell phone camera and the GoPro looks a little bit more like an actual high quality camcorder style camera. So when it comes to mounting these cameras and wearing them during the hunt, I use a head mount and I like the head mount uh, just because I found with, if I've used a chest mount and you mount the camera on your chest, your gun swings different than your chest swing. So a bird getting up, you'll often see on the chest camera, but if you go into your pose right now of how you would mount your gun, let's say you're a right-handed shooter, your chest often shifts to the side and looks over to your side where now your gun is pointed straight in front of you and your gun and arms and shoulders are lined up going straight in front of you and your chest is off looking to your side and that's what i don't like about using the chest mount is because you don't get usually you don't get the bird flushing and you don't get the shot on camera using a chest mount you get everything up until that point it looks great but as soon as that bird flushes then there it goes you, you you miss out on the funnest part of the shot right there and that's seeing the bird on the rise and getting the shot on camera and what also i like about using the head mount is you know you can move your head from side to side and you can kind of follow your dog in the field you know you can film your dog you can you know look at a buddy film him anything that you want to film all you have to do is turn your head to it and look in that direction and you're going to ca capture it on camera whereas with the chest camera you're just using or just picking up on what's directly in front of your chest and where the camera is pointing from your chest and i use the regular actually actual head strap that goes all across my my head and my hat I usually wear a hat in the field and the mount just goes right over top of my hat just like it would maybe if you think of like a hard hat or something like that. The, the strap just goes right over top of the hat and it's actually pretty comfortable. I've never had really any much discomfort from it and there is some cap clips that GoPro style cameras can mount on and then you would just clip that cap to the bill of your hat. And what I don't like about those is it makes the front of your hat very top heavy. You definitely feel the weight when it's extended out on the front of your bill versus when the camera on a head strap is just mounted right up against your forehead. And you definitely feel a little bit more top heavy on the front part of your hat when that camera is just clipped to the front of your bill. You get to gets a little bit more bouncy look to it and it's just you end up moving your head up and down a little bit more and more side to side out of an unnatural movement than what the camera would look like naturally right on your forehead so that's why i like the head mount and i try and stay away from the chest mount and the cap clips so a couple tips on running cameras to film your hunts in the field 
one, the most important thing is if you're going to do this and you want to do it, the camera has to become part of your hunting routine. And what I mean by that is, let's say you're going on a hunt, you have, you're getting ready for your hunt. You're charging your collars for your dogs. You're getting your ammo loaded in the box. You're putting your guns in cases. You're packing your clothes. Your camera has to become part of that routine. If the camera is just something that it's like, oh yeah, that's right, I have to get the camera as well, you lose focus on it and you end up not being as efficient with it as you possibly can. You forget to charge batteries, you forget to use it, you forget to even turn it on. So you have to think of the camera as now it's part of your gear on your checklist. So if you want to seriously use it and use it well and get the most out of it, it has to become part of your routine with charging batteries, clearing SD cards, making sure everything is good to go on the camera. And yeah, it just has to be part of your routine or else you're never going to fully use it to how you would hope to use it. It's just going to sit in your truck more often than not. Your batteries are going to be dead. Your SD cards are going to be full. And all that is easily avoided if you just make it part of your, your everyday hunting routine. Now, what I do every time before I start a hunt is I'll put my head mount on with the camera and then I'll look at, I'll step out of the truck and I'll look into one of my windows and look at my reflection and just see how the camera is mounted on my head, making sure that it's perfectly horizontal, it's not leaning to one side. I want the video footage to look perfectly horizontal. I don't want it to look like it's severely offset and tipping one way. When I'm looking straight in front of me, I want the camera to be looking like it's straight with the horizon line and not you know, tilted to the left or to the right. And just a quick look in the window when you get out of the truck before you start your hunt, just make sure it's it's horizontal and it's not leaning to one side and it looks good on your head. And one thing that I found and I notice what a lot of people do when they're filming their hunts is they don't fully tilt the camera down as far as they think they should. A lot of times when you think about, you know, a camera mounting on your head, you want to you're thinking about it looking straight with your eyes as if your head was perfectly straight and you're looking straight out in front of you that's what you're thinking of the camera looking so you try and you know mount the camera so it looks perfectly straight out but the ideal angle is to just to tilt it down a little bit more than what you'd think and you're going to tilt it down and you're originally going to look at it and be like wow that almost looks like it's kind of pointing straight down but you have to realize the wide angle of the camera still picks up a lot of stuff in front of you and I've noticed if I don't have the camera tilted down enough, when I'm looking straight ahead, I miss out a lot on what's directly down in front of me. When, let's say, I look down or I'm just looking straight in front of me, I'll miss a lot. I pick up a lot of the sky and I don't pick up a lot of the ground. So make sure that you tilt that camera down farther than kind of more than what you would think it would look like because it's that camera is going to capture a lot more video with the wide angle lens than you think it's going to capture. So just tilt it down and you're going to have a lot better look on the camera while you're filming. Uh, one thing while you're walking, especially in key moments that you want to make sure look good on the camera, try and keep your head steady. I noticed this a lot in my first year of filming is going back and looking through footage. It's like, damn, like I was just moving my head all over the place. And even when you're walking and you're just kind of shifting your head side to side, looking with your eyes, you don't think you're moving your head that much, but then go back and watch the footage and it looks like the camera is just all over the place. So if you're walking up to a dog on point, I try and just keep my head pointed straight at the dog or where I think the bird might, might be. I don't move my head back and forth a lot. I just try and keep looking straight in front of me and it just produces a lot better looking video. You don't have a lot of back and forth. You don't have the roller coaster type look, the jerky look of a camera that's going all over the place. It just gives it a lot more of a smoother, easier to watch look to it than when you just move your head all over the place and the camera definitely picks up on when you're moving your head. So 
try and be conscious of your head movements while you're recording. Uh, I always, I don't, I don't constantly record on my camera. I just turn the camera on when a dog gets birdie or I think we're going to head into a spot where I believe a bird could be sitting. That's usually when I turn the camera on. Uh, when my dog gets birdie or we're going into a spot where I'm assuming that a bird is going to be or just if I see something cool and I want to record it at that point. Uh, I don't always, I don't record at all times just because the files become so massive when you just record at all times and it makes it a lot harder to sift through to find the right exact moments that you're looking for. A lot of times when I think back on a hunt and I'm going through footage, I can specifically remember what my exact surroundings looked like for the clip that I want to use and I'll just start blowing through clips real quick until I find that right surrounding that I was thinking of and that's how I land on the clip that I want to use. So I find that if I don't record all the time and I record more clips, it's just easier for me to sort through the stuff that doesn't matter and get to the good stuff, the stuff that I want to use. So also with recording, pay attention to the sound the camera makes when you hit record. And that's going to be key on knowing if you're recording or you're not recording. It just by the sound that the camera makes. Like on my GoPro, I believe when I start recording, it makes three beeps. And when I hit the recording button again and the recording turns off and it stops, it'll make like seven or eight beeps really fast. So that lets me know immediately if I'm recording or I'm not recording. I've had times where I thought I was recording and I go to turn the camera off and it all of a sudden beeps really fast at me seven times and I was like, oh crap, I wasn't recording and now I am recording. So just be conscious of the beeps or the sound that the camera makes when you turn it on and off to record and that's going to let you know really fast if you truly are recording or you're not recording and you might catch yourself sometimes thinking that you're recording and then you go and hit it to think you're turning it off and the camera actually turns on so just something to be aware of is the sound that the camera makes when it starts and stops recording so let's get into what I shoot, the settings that I use when shooting on my cameras. So on both cameras, I shoot in 2.7K. And on the DJI, I shoot in 60 frames per second. And the GoPro, I shoot in 120 frames per second. Again, the reason the 60 frame per seconds on the DJI is because that's what the maximum capability for video stabilization allows on that camera. If I wanted to shoot in 120 frames per second in 2.7K on the DJI, I would have to turn the video stabilization off. But on the GoPro, I'm allowed to shoot in 2.7K in 120 frames per second with the stabilization on. And why I shoot in 2.7K versus your regular standard 1080p is because in post-production, it gives me a lot more freedom. Now, if you think of it this way, the regular size HD video is 1,920 pixels wide by 1,080 pixels high. That's your standard frame size for HD video, 1920 by 1080. Now, if you're shooting in 2.7K, your video frames file size is 2,704 pixels wide by 1,520 pixels wide. And this makes a difference in post-production because if I take a 2.7K clip and I put it into a 1920 by 1080 timeline, I can zoom in on video a lot more without losing resolution because that video clip file has a lot higher of a pixel width and height than the 1920. So it gives me the freedom to zoom in and out without losing video quality. Whereas if you were just using a 1920 by 1080 in a 1920 by 1080 timeline, if you zoom in on that video file, it's going to get a little bit blurry and distorted looking. Whereas if you zoom in on a 2.7K pixel size on a 1920 by 1080 timeline, you don't lose the resolution. 
I don't shoot in 4K just because the files are just extremely massive and they become a pain in the butt to store. They become a pain in the butt to edit because they slow my, my processor system down and my computer down and it just makes everything tougher to deal with with 4K files and I just don't need it. So that's why I just stick to 2.7K instead of 4K. Now for video storage, I use in my cameras, I use 128 gigabyte SD cards to record on. And about every two days, like let's say I'm on a hunt, let's say last year in Arizona, I was down in Arizona recording daily my hunts, what we were doing. And every two days, it takes me about two days to fill up an SD card. So every two days I would transfer my files from an SD card to a hard drive on my computer to back up and I would be able to clear that SD card and then use that SD card again the next day. And I use hard drives to back up my files instead of just switching out SD cards because SD cards, they're hard to keep track of, they get lost easy, and they can get damaged or corrupt files really easy, where if you use a hard drive to store all your footage on, it's a lot safer place to store your footage. You don't run the risk of files getting corrupted or losing things, and plus a hard drive is just a lot easier to keep track of than a tiny little micro SD card. So. Once a card fills up, I transfer it over to a hard drive and organization for your files is key here. You know, I usually date the folder, the, the day, the time, and maybe even give a type a little info on what's on that folder. And that's how I organize and save all my video files. And just to give you guys a, a reference of how much video I, I use and how fast it adds up is just footage from Arizona last year alone. I shot 530 gigabytes. And then between Montana and home here in Michigan last year, I shot 1,323 gigabytes of footage. So if you're going to do this, you also have to figure out how you're going to store all these video files because they add up fast and you have to have adequate space to save them to keep them all. Unless you do go through and you sift through all your footage daily and delete all the stuff you don't think you're going to use, uh, which I don't really do that at all. I just kind of keep everything. I guess I'm more of a collector than a trash thrower outer. You just never know what you might find in a clip or what you might be able to use from it. So I have the space to save everything. So I just say save it all and transfer everything from the SD card to a hard drive and then I clear it out. So some hard drive brands to look into if you want to transfer footage from an SD card over to a hard drive on a computer. A couple good brands that I've used and I currently use are Lacey, Western Digital, and G Drive. The most common that hard drive that I use is a Lacey and they're uh, it's actually called their rugged line. They have a kind of like a rubber molded shell, outer shell on them, and they're supposed to help if you're, you know, the hard drive gets dropped, it absorbs shock, and it's a little bit more of a weatherproof application. And it's a lot more of a rugged design than just a, st a standard plastic style casing uh, hard drive. And I, I know while I was traveling and filming hunts, it was definitely industry standard for most cameramen to be using a Lacey because, you know, let's face it, you're going to a lot of different places, you're traveling a lot, you're in the woods, you're out in wilderness areas, and if you were to drop a hard drive or something go wrong, the Lacey always held up best to uh, other performing brands. So that's why I mainly use Lacey's. It's just what I'm comfortable with. I've had good luck with them, never had an issue. And I have a couple of two terabytes all the way down to 500 gigabyte size hard drives. And for reference on size, one terabyte equals 1000 gigabytes. So a two terabyte, two terabyte hard drive will hold 2000 gigabytes on it. So, I mean, just in last year alone, I shot close to two terabytes of footage. So if I have one terabyte, or I'm sorry, two terabyte 
hard drive, that would have filled up all of my stuff from last year. I think in total I have seven hard drives and yeah, they all range in 500 gigabytes to two terabytes. Uh, for editing software, I use Adobe Premiere Pro and if you're unfamiliar with Adobe Premiere or you don't have any experience with video editing, I'm, I'm not going to try and get into this topic too much because you would definitely need a crash course lesson to understand Adobe Premiere. But if you do understand video editing uh, and whatnot, it's definitely the best program out there right now to be able to edit footage and software. And yeah, it's just what I use is Adobe Premiere Pro. I used to use Final Cut back in the day when I first came out of school. And it's funny, funny thing is, my, you know, all my professors, they said Final Cut is going to be the industry standard for years and years. And, you know, they had tape recording cameras and they said, oh, nothing's ever going to take over tape. Tape is the way that it's the now and it's the future. And Final Cut is the now and it's the future too. And then wouldn't you know it, right after I get out of school, things evolve really fast. Cameras start using SD cards and internal hard drives instead of tape. And Adobe actually becomes the front runner for editing software. And Adobe Premiere takes off and becomes much larger and a better platform to edit on than Final Cut. So just kind of a, a funny thing. I went to school for one thing and professors said that it was never going to change and it is what it is. And then lo and behold, a couple of years later, things evolve really fast and change. So that's just the world that we live with, with technology is things are constantly evolving and changing so fast. Even for me with a video background, it's hard to keep up to date on everything that's out there nowadays. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's really it right there. And if you guys have any questions on cameras or getting things set up or any, any specific questions from anything we just covered today, absolutely shoot me a message on Instagram or Facebook, or you can email us uplander18 at gmail.com. Like I said, I'll, I'll do my best to get back with you, answer any questions that you, you might have on recording hunts. If you have questions between cameras, settings that you would like to use, or just if anything in this show didn't make sense and you just have looming questions still, just shoot me a message, like I said, and I'll get back to you and, and be glad to help you out. Um, and I'm just going to leave you guys with one more little thing of advice for filming your hunts, and that is to don't ever let the want to create content overrule the enjoyment of the hunt. And the hunt itself is our purest form of joy and why we do what we do. And once you let the need to create content be ahead of the hunt, it becomes frustrating and we lose sight of the hunt itself. And we want to hunt and hunt and not hunt to create. Uh, back when I was starting to get more involved with filming and filming my hunts and specifically my deer hunts, I got so overwhelmed with just wanting to create content and create the best content that I started to realize after two years that I was just hunting to create content and not hunting to hunt anymore. And when I realized it in those terms, it made me really sad because I had lost sight of my actual passion and what I loved and enjoyed to do. And it all kind of got foggied and put off to the side uh, because I wanted to create content and film the best possible things that I could film. And I just, I just kind of got out of it a little bit at that point. And I stopped filming my own hunts. I only did it for work. And that's when I started filming other people's hunts, uh, traveling more. And when I got back to having my own time to go hunt, I stopped recording and filming it just because, you know, that time, it, it, that was my time to be in the woods. And it was my time to just enjoy hunting. And I felt like I was being tied down by wanting to create content. And, you know, that it was just overtaking and taking away from the experience of my hunt. So if you're going to do this, don't ever let the creation of content overrule your enjoyment of the hunt. I can't stress that enough. Even this last October, 
I went up north to go hunting with my dad for a weekend, grouse hunting. Got up north. I thought I had packed my camera, started unloading stuff, and I realized that I didn't have my camera with me. And I got mildly upset about the situation, even thinking about how I was like, dang, I don't even want to go hunt now because I'm not going to be able to record and be able to share the hunts and what's going on to help grow our channel. And thinking about that again, man, it really bums me out that I even had those thoughts cross my mind because that's not what hunting is about. That's certainly not what hunting with my dad is about. You're out there to have a good time. You're out there to run your dogs and you're supposed to be having fun. So don't ever let creating content overrule your enjoyment of the hunt. I'm going to leave it at that. If you guys have any questions, shoot me a message. Hope there was something you could take away from this. And yeah, thanks again for tuning in and we'll see you guys here again on the next episode of Bird Talk.